Um, welcome to this session on violence and organization. Uh, my name is um, uh, Laura Fisser. I'm uh, um, a staff member at Monash University. Um, and as I just mentioned, if you would like to introduce yourself to all the attendees here, we know that there's lots of people here that we know, but also people that we don't know. You can do that in the chat box so you can have a sense of who's there because we have about 150 people registered we figured it was better to organize this as a webinar rather than um, as an actual zoom meeting where everyone can see each other um, so as i mentioned my name is laura i am part of cross and cross is a um, research group at monash university consisting of um, all um, academics who are part of the critical management studies field and we're quite an unusually large group for a university to, to have so many critical management scholars um, and we've been lucky enough to have been able to organize this event today um, i am not actually the organizer of the event i'm just stepping in for someone else um, the true credit goes to michelle greenwood to susan mason and jordan brown as well as Farin for um, actually organizing this event and you'll see them in a second um, but I just want to make sure that they get a lot of credit. We're also organizing this together with the CMS um, webinars group. Um, so this is the, oh, sorry, I'm um, slip, skipping there. Um, the CMS webinars group uh, has been organizing webinars for people to stay in touch during COVID times. Um, and this also, we've gotten a lot of help from, the, from our own university's events team, which have been great. Um, one thing to note is that this event will be recorded and it will be made available to you afterwards um, and um, um, there will be closed captioning um, with that video. You can also use the hashtag um, VOW2020 to, if you want to tweet about this event, which we would welcome. Um, I think the last thing for me to say is that it's good to note that all of the speakers that we'll also introduce to you in a minute are Australian or um, are living in Australia um, and so some of the issues that we'll discuss will be uh, linked to Australia but we will also have a very a global um, perspective um, as, as you'll hear um, and just on that note of being Australia based uh, for those of you who don't know this we um, um, have um, um, an acknowledgement of country ceremony or, or, or um, tradition here on Australian land and I will ask Jordan to actually do that. So just bear with me for a second while I bring her in. Um, and can you put on your um, camera as well, Jordan? Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Jordan. Um, I'm a second year PhD business student and I'm also with the Cross Group. Um, but before we begin today, uh, I'd really like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all located on. So for me, I'm on the land of the Wadharong people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as the First Nations peoples who are present with us today. Sovereignty has never been ceded in so-called Australia. And so uh, I would like to acknowledge that the Monash Business School and all Monash University campuses uh, occupy the stolen lands of the people of the Kulin Nation. This is crucial to recognize when speaking from these places on violence and organization. As has recently come to the fore due to the murders of George Floyd in Turtle Island, Ahmed Arakat in Palestine, and Tanya Day and David Dugay Jr. in so-called Australia, to only name a few, settler colonial state violence is ongoingly organized in specific, localized, and globally inter-networked ways. As scholars and practitioners working within and working with organizations is therefore just as important for us to acknowledge the continual and ongoing peaceful organizing of First Nations peoples that have resisted such violence, violent exploitation and dispossession and cultivated the health and well-being of lands, waters and communities for thousands of years. And with that, I'd like to pass on to Michelle. Can I now ask everyone to turn on their video except for me and Jordan? as well as uh, turn their audio um, on. Thank you very much, um, Jordan, and thank you, Laura, before that. Um, so my name is Michelle Greenwood, and I'm with the Department of Management at Monash University. I'm a member of CROSS, and I'm also the um, co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Business Ethics. 
um, and I'm really, really pleased to be starting off this panel here today. Um, it's a very important topic that we're very dedicated to and we're really um, uh, happy to be broadening out this conversation. So um, if I could just start with a few words about the uh, connection between violence and organisation and I'll then introduce the panel and I will then after that um, uh, question the panel for a period of time before we will then open to um, a broader uh, questioning uh, scenario. So if I could start off by noting with you that violence is a signifier that's being increasingly used across a range of different settings. But how the term violence is used and by whom matters. Journalist Rebecca Solnit entreats us to differentiate between the act of breaking a door to escape a burning building and the act of breaking a door to terrorise those inside. Those who've been sub subject to long-standing systematic violence that deprives them of their basic rights and equality such as victims of domestic violence or forced labour, experience violence as a form of terror. Indeed, the term intimate terrorism is used by some, some commentators to describe the experience of domestic violence for women when they're involved in intimate partner relationship violence. It's vital, therefore, to develop an understanding of violence as embedded in its context and, it's in his, and, and in its history and involving the very institutions that purport to protect those most likely to be harmed. In the words of Zizek, we should step back from the fascinating law of direct, visible, subjective violence, violence performed by a clearly identifiable agent. Criminal, criminologist Stephen Toombs says something similar when he is concerned that definitions of violence that focus on individual agency and direct intent are prioritised even when at stake is the violence of organisations, institutions or states. According to Toombs, we fallaciously consider the moral culpability of the intentional killer of a particular person as greater than that of a mine executive who cuts corners indirectly causing the harm of unknown people. These people may not be these, these, these people may not um, be intending to harm a particular person, but they know that their actions are likely to harm any number of people rather than a particular person. And as such, they show a general contempt for the lives of humans. Our focus today is on violence in and with organisations. Hence, drawing from, the, from Coombs, I would like to open, open with two prompts. First, to shift our focus from the level of the individual to some form of collective level, both with regard to the source of violence and with, the, with regard to the experience of violence. And second, to shift our focus from direct violence to structural violence. That is violence that is systematically or structurally as a consequence of a variety of organisational or institutional arrangements. Our panel consists today of four excellent scholars and practitioners, and I'd like to, to thank them for their involvement in developing the program to date and their involvement today. Unfortunately, due to illness, Jackie True, who was meant to be with us, cannot be with us, but we thank her for her, her contribution thus far. We're very fortunate, though, to have had on the um, organising team, Farine Alamagir, who, for those of you who know her research, has got a strong expertise in this area, and she has agreed to join the panel at late notice. She'll also then reappear as the moderator for the Q&A, so we've got her working really uh, very hard today. So I'm gonna start off by introducing the panel and then I'll move to start, starting some questioning of them. So Farine just mentioned, Farahman Alagir is lecturer at, in business ethics at the Monash Business School. Her research focuses on issues of social justice, globalization and the feminization of workforces. Lara Watson is a Birigara woman from cent central western Queensland, an Indigenous officer with the Australian Council of Trade Unions. For those of you not familiar, the Australian um, Council of Trade Unions is the uh, Australia's trade union peak body. Marie C. Grave is Associate Professor, Criminologist and Researcher from the uh, Gender Violence um, uh, Gender and Family Violence Prevention Centre at Monash University and also the Monash University uh, Migration and Inclusion Centre. Um, Pia Chiveri is a unionist uh, activist 
and co-leader of the women's team uh, at the Victorian Trades Hall Council. The Victorian Trades Hall Council is Victoria's peak trade union body, comprising of 40 unions and representing 40, 430,000 workers. So we have a, a strong mix of um, uh, broad discipline here, um, both within scholarship and also within practice. And I welcome you all and thank you for your involvement. Moving now to, to, to our debate with the panel, I would like to start um, with, uh, with this question that I'll be um, posing in, in the main to Lara and Marie. The Prime Minister of Australia, speaking about the Black Lives Matter protests last week, had to do quite a backtrack after claiming that Australia does not have a history of slavery. Modern slavery seems to be a term that has come from nowhere in business discourse and public policy. However, it is a construct with a long history rooted in colonial trajectories and dispossession, and seems to be being invoked for any number of variety of political purposes. I'd like to start off with a question for Laura about what she would say to the Prime Minister given an opportunity about slavery in Australia. Yes, well, I had the opportunity to respond to that. And what I let um, the Prime Minister know about is blackbirding in this country. My great great grandfather was kidnapped from native Numea, brought to Mackay to cut sugarcane as a slave. And the conditions were so bad for him that he ran away. Um, and it was the very Gubba mob that actually hid him. So we have this whole history in Australia around blackbirding and slavery in the early days. We've also got the case of stolen wages. You know, for a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country, their pay for work was in flour and tea and sugar. So we have this whole generation's there that would not pay for the wages that for the work that they done and even today we have the community development program in place in remote aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia and they are actually in a modern day slavery term they are doing work that we considered a wage a full-time job anywhere else in the country but they get the equivalent of a job seeker payment so definitely Australia has not only been built on slavery, it still occurs today. Um, uh, Lara, thank you for that. It may, may be helpful now to turn to Marie and ask whether you could actually talk to us a little bit about this term, modern slavery. Could you problematize it for, for us? Where has it come from and how is it being deployed? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much. And I just, I think one of the beginning points is to recognize that the engagement with, with modern slavery in its contemporary form and creation is largely devoid of the historical links that Lara speaks about and absolutely in Australia is not a conversation that is about our uh, history of colonisation and the, the practices Lara talked about are not practices that inform the conversation today about modern slavery. I think it's really important to understand why modern slavery has absolutely become a popularised term and it is used broadly to refer to many different things, um, including things like wage theft. That's not really what it is actually defining and that's, that's its own specific problem. We've seen that businesses, uh, Andrew Forrest, uh, Mindaroo has absolutely uh, led the push towards capturing and responding to modern slavery and for this be, to be something that business want to adopt the Global Slavery Index has allowed that kind of language to be predominant. But modern slavery in Australia is tied to, the Modern Slavery Act is actually defined and tied to our criminal code. And the criminal code really comes from the trafficking, human trafficking legislation. I think it's important to recognise that from the turn of the century, of this century, Trafficking came about because of a concern around transnational organised crime and groups of feminists essentially arguing about women crossing borders for sex work and that history is important because it came about at a time when there was a concern internationally around transnational organised crime and human trafficking was embedded into that. So it was, it was gendered but it was predominantly a criminal justice focus. 
there were victims and offenders, the emphasis was on legal regimes. And since that time, we've had an ongoing um, extension of how human trafficking is understood. And now we're seeing a broadening to this, this idea of modern slavery. Why that's important is because from its inception in the, in the Palermo Protocol is the failure to recognise women as migrant labourers. That has been a consistent critique of a criminal justice model. It looks for victims, it, it associates national responses with benevolent rescuers, and that's inherently problematic when we think about women's labour burden and migrant labourers and the number of women who are involved as labourers for irregular migrants. So that's, I think that's essential to talk about because most of the modern slavery conversations that businesses are having as part of their corporate and social responsibility and human rights uh, responsibility uh, commitments doesn't talk about that. We talk about extreme cases of exploitation, but we don't think about the complexity within which uh, these practices arise and the ways in which employment law, mig uh, migration law and regulation and other policies all coalesce to create, to create these conditions. So we have quite a few problems with the expansion of, from the move away from human trafficking, which is a very specific form of exploitation, to the adoption of modern slavery, because what has happened is largely uh, an umbrella term. And that, that creates challenges of, rep of responding with specificity. So forced labour is a very different thing to forced marriage. And that's also different to human trafficking. It requires specificity and, and uh, some careful attention. And I think in terms of the things that we're thinking about, one of the things that modern slavery acts do and the promotion of businesses being responsible and, and one of the things we can talk more about is the idea that we can regulate businesses to take responsibility but one of the key challenges there is enabling and supporting businesses to listen to migrant workers rather than deciding for themselves how best to protect workers and how best to protect women migrant workers. Terrific, thank you. And so I, I hear what you're saying, similar to what um, uh, I think of the, my opening comments about the concern of the uh, criminologist Steve Toombs about not seeing this entirely in a um, uh, crim criminology in a, in a crime model. Um, in fact, you could really argue that violence is um, built into, in fact, foundational of our economic and social systems writ large. Farine, can I turn to you and ask, how have systems of global competition and economic inter, um, uh, integration expanded and flourished by taking advantage of um, existing inequalities and discrimination and the violence that, that's embedded into that? Thanks, Michelle. What I see that, as you say, that uh, what uh, pointed out by Lara and, and uh, uh, Mary, that dispositions and transnational at one uh, side that there, there was dispossession. So there is a history of colonialism and dispossession. And then there is, and now we see the transnational aspects and the transnational reg uh, regimes, particularly um, as a labor regimes or the way we frame it. So when I look at this, I see it from two perspectives. First of all, from the Global South context, the policy imperatives like the policy from the World Bank for the structural adjustment program or industrial restructuring, but indeed, it, uh, how, I mean, what indeed the implications uh, are. Uh, if I uh, take an example from my uh, PhD thesis, so uh, it's all about the loss of jobs and redundancy and job, be, job which, which was supposed to be, or which was a right or entitlement, it became a provision and opportunity. And that's the way new liberal, new liberal ideologies of capitalism came into global south, where the uh, ethical intent uh, was, you know, opportunity, freedom, and choice. So this opportunity, freedom, and choice work in other way around when people 
uh, start you know migrating from the global south to the global north so then it cre uh, and there is there has been a process by the state the state took or the state has taken this visa flexibility procedure so you see how it impacted in two uh, in two ways in one policy imperatives in relation to the global south context on the other hand the flexibilization of laws and regimes that reconfiguring life uh, and life and living itself and whatever indeed was uh, entitlement or right that became an opportunity and that became an issue of uh, choice and that are entangled with ethical intent of freedom and choice and so that we on the other hand what we see here that there is a constitution of othering in the process of you know if you take worker as an example that there is a constitution of othering migrant workers ethnic minority workers refugee workers women workers and that implicated later on uh, when uh, when they became involved or entangled with the global production system so at the end of the day we see state becomes important well a state has already lost all its you know credibility and accountability in order to make the conducive uh, uh, environment for business uh, but state became an umpire in in all cases so there is there was there is and there has been a structured inequality and that in a structured that structured inequality causes expulsion to some extent came out regimes came out with sanctioned rights and all those that you know if you are in there if you work in export processing zone you are allowed to have this this but you are not allowed to form a basic uh, union at your factory level or you cannot be associated with trade union federations as a worker students their voice so we see sanctioned rights entitlements we see expulsion at the end and uh, and then there is a, uh, there there was dispositions there is a disposition but i find it's 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 all about swing uh, plundering and swindling and then it's a disposition well, thank you, Farry. And I'll just um, turn to Marie for a minute because I don't know whether you would like to come in here. You've, you've made the point um, in the past about the way in which economic and social systems that are designed support, purportedly to protect society often sustain and, and replace conditions um, uh, within which abuse and violence occurs. And uh, just following on from what Farina is saying, Marie, I wondered if you wanted to comment a bit further about that. Yeah, thanks very much and thanks, Farine. I think um, one of the things that happens is they tend to be, these things tend to be isolated and not thought about uh, collectively. And I'm thinking very much about uh, a large project I did with UN Women and ILO last year across ASEAN talking to women migrant workers and thinking about the intersections of trafficking and responses to violence against women. So we see these kinds of intersections of how labour law uh, economic systems, social systems, but as I said, labour and migration systems and policies interact and can, uh, you know, if you take the example of even in Myanmar, the, um, the uh, decision to stop women from uh, migrating for domestic work in order to protect them didn't result in protection of women, it resulted in pushing women into irregular migration. So created significant harm, in fact, in doing that by creating that, that process. But I think it's I think it's important important I recognise that we have um, people from uh, many different places who are part of the webinar. But I wanted to think take the example of the seasonal work, the Pacific Work Scheme in Australia, because that is really an example of a scheme that is seen as wholly positive and that it is a win win. It's a development scheme. It's this small policy that's going to win for our neighbouring nations because it will ostensibly train people who can skill to their country of origin, come on short-term visas, there's a welfare uh, uh, system, kind of an oversight that's attached to that. And it's also sold as this great labour scheme to enable um, uh, the, the horticulture, the agriculture industry to get seasonal workers who can come for a short period of time, who's a guaranteed workforce and who are doing uh, what is recognized, largely thought of as unskilled work, but is of course actually skilled work. And you need people who can come and do that work and commit to that 
to that work. And um, in, in the creation of that system, if you think about how Australia has set that system up, there's, there's all these processes set in place and there are, there, is, there are people who are profiting, of course, from that labour in, those, in, in Fiji, in the Pacific nations and beyond who are accessing that scheme. Um, and who are involved in that movement of labour. And, and it has the remittance effect that is, has its benefit in terms of a financial benefit. But there may, we need to kind of continually call that scheme to account. And this has come up in my own work, and I think uh, recently Stephen uh, Karuna has, has brought this to the attention publicly, as well as in his own interactions. Um, there were unintended, effectively, interactions. But what, what we see is in that system, there is a, there is a mechanism for what to do if, um, if, you know, if the work conditions are good. And it's a, it's a system of complaint. But the whole way that scheme is set up is set up in, in, a, in a way that's quite similar to what I see when we go and talk to, you know, when I work with my colleague, Dana Simpson, and go and talk to um, purchasing managers about how they're going to protect a workforce. And you, maybe you have a hotline and people call that hotline. But if you go and talk to people from Fiji, from Pacific Islands, they do not have a culture of complaint. They do not call a number and say, hey, this is really, this is really terrible how I'm being treated. I'm being assaulted. I'm being sexually harassed. Uh, I'm being exploited. That's not what people do. And I've spent a lot of time working on um, working with people who are irregular or unlawful migrant labourers in Australia. And they might have overstayed a visa, they're working in breach of a visa, but also some of the people I've spoken to are people who absconded from that scheme. And they've absconded from it because the conditions were so awful. But they do not engage with that system of protection at all. And the consequence of that is that they will be criminalised. They'll be deported. There are consequences for them. They will be punished. And I think just in that small example that's often seen as this really positive initiative, we need to understand that this idea that it's a win-win, that it's creating all these positive economic benefits as well as development benefits, we need to question that and we need to particularly think about our understandings of how violence is experienced, but how we respond. Uh, I think that's absolutely critical to think about how do we can continue to actually reproduce and sustain those conditions. If we don't change how that works, that's going to keep happening. So I think that's, there's some of the things we need to think about. The Australian, that, that example in a way is a small example, but we can see that writ large in various examples internationally. So that's um, a really interesting the way that you, um, one of the many things that you've highlighted there, Marie, is the idea that we think that economic participation is going to overcome these systematic problems and overcome uh, violence in this way. I'd like to turn to, to Lara for a minute then, um, and that is um, to, to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the, the focus on economic participation in Australia for Indigenous uh, um, peoples. So at the moment, there is this uh, uh, a federal inquiry into the pathways and participation for opportunities for Indigenous Australians. And if you could reflect on that, I know that the ACTU has made, been making submissions into that inquiry. Um, and I think you wanted to speak about the way in which um, um, uh, the way in which privilege is handed to some actually become violence experienced by, by others in this regard. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, Marie summed it up really, really well with what's happening in the Pacific Islands. And we see a similar model being rolled out in remote communities. I probably wouldn't put privilege in the same a sentence but when you look at I guess the labor force because of consecutive government intervention you could say that a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been excluded from the labor force um, they also haven't really had the opportunity to be able to build their own economic base you know we can have really qualified uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women, particularly women, it seems to happen more often too, that they're in these casualised um, industries and they're not in permanent employment and they hold a doctorate. And so 
there's a lot of questions around well why and when you actually look at the setup that government has done over consecutive governments that basically set Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people up to we don't work like it is this misconception out there that we need a program we need to be involved in a program to get a job um, but we have many many highly skilled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country and that kind of institutionalized racism within organizations is really hard um, to get away from and it does impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regards to be able to have the dignity of work um, to be able to work effectively and in safe environments and to build an economic base um, we've got a long way to go you know you, you now have a program that is open to private enterprise in remote communities that see Aboriginal workers as a cheap source of labour because they get this cheap worker for, t for 26 weeks and at the end of it they get an incentive payment because they put this person on for 26 weeks. But at the end you've then got an Aboriginal person that's back on CDP. You know, I've come across qualified builders in remote communities and you drive around the community and we counted 30 plus fly in, fly out workers that were working on new builds and extensions. But here we have a local man, fully qualified builder and can't get a job and is on CDP. It, it's actually really ridiculous with what we're seeing in remote communities. Um, we need to stop these punitive programs being implemented and we need to actually look at job investment on country in communities so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people also can access the dignity of work and the education that they need for these skills to do the jobs. Um, I think there have been a couple of mentions about the gendered nature of some of these um, concerns about economic systems and I just wanted to, to ask you Pia to come in here and to um, um, help us think more about the way in which violence is systematically uh, gendered and that this is not just something that's happening at work but also at home and the interaction between home and work here. Pia if you could unmute your Yes I now. just realised of course I had to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely at the focus of our work um, in the Women's at Victorian Trades Hall Council is uh, that gender impacts work and particularly gender violence impacts the workplace. Uh, we work with a definition of gendered violence that includes the very systems in which we work. So it doesn't just um, cover behaviour such as the obvious one of sex sexual harassment or a physical assault. It also, um, it also is underpinned by an idea that the actual systems of work in which we work are the problem and actually violate working women in the workplace constantly. So to give you some examples, I guess we would always say that, um, agreeing with Lara's point that this country was, um, the invasion of Australia has meant that this, for the last 200 years, we've been building a system that is systematic, systematically racist, misogynistic, um, racist towards others coming from other countries um, who might want to migrate here or work here or study here, etc. So we see that that also has come from the master-servant dynamic that um, England operates under, which is that there is hierarchies of importance, importance of work. <laughs> In, um, that, in that system. So that's why we have uh, more privilege afforded to certain workers over others. So it's interesting during COVID-19 that we've seen um, some of the female dominated industries come to the fore and we've realized or seen how important they are. So cleaners, early childhood educators, nurses, um, workers who generally are not um, given the opportunities that other areas of work are given. But in terms of um, your point about the systems of asking about the actual workplace and systems of work and the impact on gender, we would say that um, there's so much I could go on and on about the way systems work against women. So if we think about um, even 
your normal average business hours, nine to five. Um, nine o'clock start in an office is the same time that school starts. So for a start, we've got a clash between usually mothers who will be dropping children off to school at that time. Um, often we see women having to negotiate individually to try and get concessions around that, like asking to stay to start work later or potentially trying to get children out of the house earlier. Um, but the burden falls to women to to deliver that and what that means to us is that the system itself is failing those women the system doesn't accommodate or show any flexibility towards those women they individually have to scramble around to try and make everything work for them their family their workplace and i think another point of covid has really highlighted this for those of us who are um, either being able to work from home or even those who are still having to attend work but have children at home and suddenly have um, during the home learning period i mean suddenly having to sort of juggle both those areas very visibly and i think a lot of that um, systemic violence or violation of women in the workplace has really come to the fore and is very hard to avoid um, uh, actually brought me um, to, to thank you very much to the to the next question around the impact of COVID on um, on both I think the the local scenario but also more um, uh, globally perhaps we'll start with the more global um, the implications of COVID on of mark, ma uh, market closures and limitations of movement on supply chain workers and migrant workers um, uh, is particularly um, fraught for women and children who may be vulnerable to violence. And I'd like to, to return to Farine here if we can. Um, Farine, um, your, your involvement with the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh, could you tell us a little bit about what you know to be the experience of workers, the recent experience with what's happening with these limitations of movement and, um, and market closures uh, due to COVID? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, when I look at this, you know, I think it reminds me of all those, you know, movies of James Bond's, a license to kill or live and let die. So for example, the way we see, you know, the, uh, the way the, and, uh, this uh, brand, uh, global brands and retailing agencies, they started, you know, cancelling all those uh, orders, it shows that there is, that the, whatever we have discussed, particularly this discussions that started since the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory and, uh, and by initiating the culture of compliance through those uh, two safety accords, the accords and uh, the alliance uh, for making uh, first uh, on the safety issues. It seems, I mean, we don't see, you know, any sort of uh, any sort of uh, examples in that ways that the brands have taken to take this responsibility as a responsibility, the way they frame responsibility or the way Ragis principles or UN framework, you know, uh, defined responsibility. So there has been cancellation of all, uh, and and at one point of time, the president of the suppliers associations, she, I mean, she kept mentioning about the three billion dollar what net loss and they cannot be at, uh, and there would be a job loss and that job loss figure would be like two million uh, two million so four million uh, workers are employed and 80 percent of them are women and now we are uh, listening that there would be a job loss or they, they, and it has started in uh, in fact and what uh, and by to, by today I think one one million workers have already lost their jobs but government came out with the rescue package. So what happened with this rescue package? And the most important questions that I keep asking to myself as well as to other researchers who have been researching uh, RMG sectors for the last seven years after the collapse of Rana Plaza, we see there is a publications industry and there, is, there are series of publications as well as practitioner research. But the question arises here, where the worker is in this entire discussions we see BGME is there, or the suppliers associations and the president. She has been talking, even she has asked help from WFP, as there is a possibility of, you know, feminine and all those things, all those aspects. So she has asked help from WFP. And there is a rescue package from the state. 
but we don't see workers here. That is the problematic issues that there is no trade union or federations for the workers effectively who could who could make this inv invisible workers visible we, and now if you see from two aspects the scholarly uh, aspects and the practitioner aspects in the scholarly domain you would see number of papers i have already got published regarding participation committee political csr in and then business and human rights model in case of the uh, garment industry or element garments factory in bangladesh then where are those workers and how this job I mean, how this, uh, why, the, why we, don't, we don't see them now in a bargaining situation? That means that this entire compliance culture and that's responsibility notions is just, uh, I gosh, I mean, uh, whatever, because we published papers, we say there is a multi-level stakeholders initiatives, there is a governance, there is an accountability, but we don't see it then there is an accountability. So for the workers, it's a, uh, we see that they had to they, they had to take a three times long march from Dha from their villages to Dhaka for in relations to ensure they or to confirm their job. So it says that they they I mean they are their living is regulated, and it's it's a, it's the responsibility are upon the hands of the owners of the supply uh, of the factories, and the state is completely silent in in relations to these issues. So the question, for me, I always, uh, it seems to me that the workers are still invisible here. We have got, we have published few papers, we have got few funding, so yeah, things of practitioners research. And now I would like to get back to Mari's, uh, um, uh, um, what Mari's mentions about criminalize, criminalization. Now, if these workers are going to lose jobs, then what they're going to do? Are they going to end up having a sex work in, in brothel? So is this the process? Is this the process of the new, uh, you know, the responsible capitalism talks, the criminalization of the economy? And is this the way responsibility, responsibility works? Marie, would you like to come in here? <clears throat> well, I might just, thanks, thanks, Farine. I think I'm, I might not take up maybe the last point exactly, but I, I think absolutely I'd like to echo um, some of Farine's concern, uh, concerns, particularly around what we've seen companies doing around force majeure clauses and stopping payments, refusing to honour orders, all of these things are happening. And I think what we've seen uh, in, in the pandemic is actually the, that no one's really paying much attention um, to, to workers. Um, and uh, I did write with, uh, with Dana Simpson earlier this week about, you know, about virtue signalling and what's actually happening and the need to really look at the ways that women in particular are in, at high risk because they're often in low-skilled, low-valued work and they're migrant labourers and they're disproportionately impacted. And we can see that this globally and we can see it in Australia in terms of the refusal of our federal government to protect temporary workers. And I mean, we can think about that as a refusal to protect temporary migrant workers, but in some of the other work I do, that's also absolutely closely connected to the interpersonal violence of family violence and the way that that is contributing to family violence and creating significant harm to, to women and their children and uh, significant insecurity. So I think it's, you know, if we think about the pandemic and what happens after it, you know, I think that the main, one of the main concerns is that there has been essentially uh, less attention and some, some release of the obligation for companies to uphold uh, regulatory compliance. And this isn't just in relation to labour, it's in relation, in, relation to, um, in relation to the environment and, and all sorts of forms of regulation where it's become very difficult. It's very difficult to, um, to monitor labor it's very difficult to monitor what they're doing so you know maybe we should just make it a bit easier and then we see all these all sorts of all sorts of harms coming out as as a consequence of that so there's there's some really significant and important things to do and i think one of my concerns is that as we move forward in uh in a recession um is that 
that these things are costly, actually. It's quite costly for companies to move beyond just uh, a verbal commitment to saying we'd like to ensure there's no slavery in our supply chain or any exploitation. How do they know they do that? That requires commitment. And, you know, one of the things I often talk to people in that position about is, well, when you say you're, you're committed to this, are you going to pay workers if they haven't been paid? Are you going to remunerate them? No one, who's going to pay that money for people who haven't been paid, for example? So the, the, one of the big concerns is, is that actually um, that we're going to take, you know, we'll put a break on some of these efforts and, and continue kind of to feel good about what we're doing without any, without any pressure to do anything that's significantly substantial or any real accountability around it. But I think also when we, just in terms of the conversation we're having and about moving beyond interpersonal violence and thinking about organisational and structural harm, m most of my work is around migration systems and a lot of my work is around border and the harms of bordering practices. And this affects women regardless of whether they are temporary, irregular workers at the lowest end of a supply chain or whether they're in Australia on, um, on a skilled working visa. The way that our visa system is set up, the way that people can be tied to their employer creates conditions where people are afraid to come forward and share what's happening to them, the kinds of exploitation that's happening to them. And that is, that is a gendered form of exploitation and businesses profit from that. These things are interconnected and I think our challenge is, is to be talking about that and bringing that to bear. We have a couple of questions coming in from from the um, audience and um, uh, not picking up on your last point but a, but a bit of an earlier point that you've made Marie and also what um, um, Farine was starting to talk about. One question we have is um, in terms of structural violence um, uh, to what extent can we would we can we make the argument that corporate crimes and violence that have occurred in the global south are a consequence of, of policies and actions that have occurred in the global north. So I'm wondering whether either Marie or um, Farin would like to respond to this idea, this idea that it's what's happening both in terms of action and, and, and um, policy level in the global north that's affecting the global south. But I actually will then also move towards um, Lara and thinking about um, the degree to which um, this is maybe not a, just a global north, global south issue, but in fact a colonizer, colonized issue as well. Farin, did you want to speak? Um, sorry, I, uh, I was looking at the questions. So what, uh, what do you, did you ask me? So, well, either you or Marie, whoever would like to pick up on it, and if not, we can, we can move on. This, the question was, um, in terms of structural violence, to what extent could we argue that corporate crimes and violence that have occurred in the global south are a consequence of global north actions and policies? Uh, I mean, I think we need to do research more on this, that whether this is a consequence and all, but what I see, but I, and what my research says, that is based on my thesis I did uh, from uh, 2009 to 2013, and then I've been doing, I've been doing research on uh, global production network and the RMG sector, ready-made government sectors. Uh, I, I I can give an example for an uh, like when the structural adjustment program or the restructuring started, and that is a policy of the uh, of the World Bank. Uh, and how it implicated the family level in um, uh, of the workers. So at one point there was uh, the, all those youth meals, which is owned by the government, flooded with money because if the people go for golden handshakes, but people who go, went for retirement, they didn't get their um, they didn't get their uh, retirement benefits on time. So there was a, there are in, uh, there are you know, examples. I mean, I came across when I had been there the suicidal case and others that father could not be able to pay the dowry for uh, during her, uh, during their daughter's marriage. So the father or the mother committed suicide, or the girl went for some other things which is not which is not regarded as something uh, that is dignified as a war. 
So I don't know how I'm going to uh, relate this as a global north uh, corporate crime, but this is exactly the policy that came from the global north or the global policy institutions where the policy maker, uh, makers are basically from the from are European or American to some extent, and that is the World Bank and others as we discuss. So uh, I'm sorry, I don't know whether no, I... No. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you. And, and I think this is a good time to come across to, to Lara if you'd like to um, uh, uh, respond to this idea that it's not that we, we often think about this global north, global south um, um, imposition and, and uh, the exploitation and violence that comes with that. Um, if you'd like to reflect on it, Lara. Yeah. Indulge me, please. I, I picked up on a comment um, that Farine had said around trade unions um, not being at the negotiation or the bargaining table. So, and I, I, it was great that she touched on invisible workers because that is the same kind of issue what's happening in remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander com communities as well as migrant communities that are working here. You know, companies and governments are using the systems to hide these workers. And even when we find these workers, like um, Aboriginal communities, the government's using the Social Security Act to hide the fact that they are actually doing jobs, but they're not. Um, they participate in activities and it actually excludes the capacity for an industry body like trade unions to actually represent these workers. Um, I know United Workers Union has been doing some great work with uh, Fijians coming over. So they're coming over already aware of the trade union. Um, but for, we need to find the workers first. And the second one is, is fear. So that's my biggest issue that I face in the work that I do is, you know, these workers are so scared. They're scared about what's going to happen to them. They're scared about what's going to happen to their family and what's going to happen to their community. So that really does impact the capacity of a trade union to get involved in these areas. And we need to work out better ways to break down that fear, I think. Um, in regards to the decolonization, I think COVID um, really did expose a lot of issues in this area. Um, you know, we, we saw people do this panic buy um, in our urban centres, um, but what we actually saw in remote communities was everything had disappeared and there was price gouging happening. So, you know, uh, a tin of coffee, I think, was $85. Like, it was absolutely ludicrous um, what we were seeing through COVID. Um, and we had a government here that actually committed to food security. Um, but they put that money into business, <laughs> not actually into the community itself. And what we saw was no flow through. So not only were these price gouges, but we had run out of food in many remote communities. You know, we had remote communities that didn't have access to essential items and cleaning products and, and food items to make it through this COVID crisis, but the government had no problem sending out body bags and there was no sensitivity around these children's body bags that were sent out to remote communities. I mean, we knew had COVID got into one of these communities would have had absolutely devastating effects on that community. But with a, a community that's already suffered a lot of trauma, this had just escalated everything, seeing children body bags come into their community from government when they were asking for cleaning products. So there is definitely a huge disconnect. Um, and, you know, for us personally, we realise that the work that we've been doing is not good enough and that there's a whole other area and stuff that we need to include in the work that we do as well. And that's around essential communications as well as um, essential items that need to be readily available. Um, Pia, um, uh, both uh, Lara and Farin have talked about the invisible worker. Um, uh, could, could you uh, speak for a little bit about what we know about um, the invisibility of women at, at home during COVID, working from home, and the, um, the sorts of experiences that they're, um, and the vulnerabilities that, that, that come with that? Yeah, sure. 
We, during this period, have um, undergone trying to actually connect with women working at home to understand exactly what they are going through rather than just guessing. However, what we guessed was happening, which was that they described their workload um, you know, being exacerbated through the roof the, because they were also usually minding children or ed educating, supporting children to be educated at home, um, might have other, other adults in the house. So some of them described um, adult children returning home who'd been on traveling overseas or who'd been in a share house studying, lost a hospitality job, had to give up on their lease and move back home. So suddenly they have all these people in the house. Um, they're also meant to be working from home. And what they described to us was their workload um, rising exponentially, but also not very much give um, in terms of what they were expected to deliver to the workplace. And again, going back to those standard hours of the nine to five hours, a lot of those Women, obviously people who can work from home are generally working your standard office hours. And those women were, um, were really feeling the pressure to deliver the work in that time whilst also being expected to deal with all these other people in the household and often um, assisting children to home learn and you know, use technology when there might not have been enough technology even in the household for every member to use at the same time, etc. So they described to us um, extreme amounts of pressure. So we, um, we got this information through uh, Zoom, face-to-face -face Zoom meetings with groups of women and also an online survey, which really um, told us that these women were facing extreme stress, extreme levels of work, but also um, in some ways taking things into their own hands because they were feeling so pressured that some of those women told us they were on long service leave, like they'd taken long service leave to sit at home during a pandemic and support their children, you know, which is not the purpose of long service leave. And it seems to me a real injustice that those women would have worked for all those years um, when it's hard enough for women to access long service leave um, because of casualised labour and their... Um, taking time to care for children, et cetera, et cetera. And yet here we hear, heard stories of women taking long service leave just to take the pressure off so they could just focus on looking after their children and assisting them. Um, in the same way we heard of women taking leave without pay, we heard of women taking annual leave, um, and probably the worst examples were women who'd quit their jobs, so quit permanent jobs because they felt so pressured. And we have a gender pay gap in this country that's um, significant, sits at around 17% on an average, but obviously it's much higher in certain industries. It's extremely high for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, women of colour from other um, migrant backgrounds, etc. So in fact, we can't afford for women to be forced out of the workforce during this time um, or reducing hours or minimising their time at work because of the pandemic. And um, our point of view is that the pandemic has really, really exposed the injustices that women face in the workplace uh, or work and home as well. And we'd call home the workplace in lots of ways for working women. Yeah, we have a question from the audience that um, I think if you could follow on with, that would be great. And mm -hmm. if anybody else would like to come in here, um, uh, do you see any promise in the new ILO Convention 190 on eliminating violence and harassment in the world of work? Uh, the commenters said it's not been adopted by many countries, but this might be an entry point to address some of the issues that you have raised here. Yeah, definitely. We would love to see it um, ratified by the Australian government. And in fact, Lara's colleague, Sophie Ishmael, is, um, has been negotiating this. Uh, she was part of the group that went over to Geneva to um, debate on the ILO. And um, certainly uh, it's, it's the end result was not the version, I guess you could say, that the VTHC and ACTU had hoped, but it was certainly much closer to nothing that was what we had before. So yes, if we could get um, that ratified, for sure, we could 
uh, probably see ways of using that in Australia wide. Um, in Victoria, the regulator WorkSafe has actually recognised gendered violence as an issue um, and does have a gendered violence guide, so which is a guide for employers to understand gendered violence in that broader way that we talk about, the systemic ways as well as the more obvious ways. So there, there are shifts in that sense that I think we'll see at least in Victoria, some change around the issue of gendered violence in the workplace. Um, but certainly the ILO convention would go a long way to <laughs> assisting our work going forward, definitely, for all working, to advantage all working women or any other group that's more likely to experience violence in the workplace. Thank, thanks, Pia. Um, uh, um, we also have heard anecdotally that there's been a, a lot of um, issues with the work family um, dynamic uh, breaking down that have even increased the, or, or rather decreased the safety for women um, suffering from intimate partner violence. Um, sorry to keep you on the spot, but, uh, but as you've, you've sort of um, alluded to this, but haven't talked about it specifically, Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, I'm just wondering whether uh, that's something that um, uh, uh, whether, I mean, we, we, we know this has increased during COVID-19, whether there are any lessons that we can even start to draw from this. Sure. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by a coughing dog on the couch. <laughs> She's rolling around and coughing and spluttering for some reason. Um, so, yeah, certainly we've um, seen that there's been an increase in family violence. Um, I mean, it was predicted. Some of what we saw in the response to the pandemic, which obviously everybody was off the cuff, like we all had to suddenly work out how are we going to work safely. We suddenly had to go home to work during a pandemic. And we always talk about it as working from home during a pandemic because we didn't work from home in a planned way where we had six months lead in time to properly assess and establish home offices to get everything set up. It was, you know, all done within weeks, days sometimes. So um, what, that, what that really um, indicated to us was that the first response to get everybody at home was actually quite unsafe for some people um, because all the evaluations or assessments for people to work from home really looked at the physical issues in the household. Like, do you have a computer? Will you be able to work quietly somewhere? You know, do you have proper lighting, etc.? There was nothing about um, family violence as a risk or other psychosocial hazards. Um, like having care of children. So I'm not calling children a hazard per se, but the system of being expected to work whilst having children in the same space, also being expected to be cared for, um, creates a clash and a hazard of uh, a risk of injury to the worker who's responsible for that, usually the mother in a heterosexual family. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that we um, <coughs> really saw family violence uh, not being addressed or considered in the initial response and then some workplaces did actually reassess and then open their offices for those people who identified that actually working from home was not going to be safe for them but I think what it's really indicated to us going forward is that we need to be much more there's been a lot of shift around this as an issue and the way it affects the workplace but I think for us it really highlighted the way it has to be um, at the fore when we when we think about things like the changing way we work um, and potentially the risk that in there'll be further similar human created emergencies like this where we will be working from home and we need to factor in the way family violence will impact. Um, and just quickly, there was actually a case, um, I think it's in South Australia, I really only saw the article in the last few days that actually um, where Fair Work Australia had actually acknowledged that a death at home due to family violence was actually a workplace death. So that really opens up a whole raft of um, responsibilities for the employer to recognise that in a changing way that we're going to have to work going forward, we need to be able to assess and um, minimise risk of family violence impacting the worker in the workplace. Does that answer your question? Oh, it does. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. Um, so we um, have a number of questions that have come in from the, uh, the, the, the audience and I'm going to uh, uh, start to look at them. Farin, I don't know whether you want to, to, to join me in that. 
Um, there is actually a question for um, Marie. Um, so Marie, one question that's been asked of you is, how do we protect guest seasonal workers from the Pacific in Australia? Um, and the, the questionnaire goes on to say, surely migrant workers need to be protected under Australian law, especially given that seasonal guest work schemes are often seen as better than aid. Well, we need to protect workers by having multiple ways that they can talk about their working conditions and that they're not talking to people outside of their community and who are known and, and trusted. So the reliance, as I said, for example, on um, uh, people who they don't, don't know and aren't from their community as the people that they should trust and tell about the work working conditions is inherently problematic, as well as relying on here's a, here's a number to call if there's a problem. Um, and the other thing we need to think about in terms of protection um, more broadly, and it extends beyond this, beyond this scheme, is recognising what workers need. There's no incentive to come forward if you fear you will lose your job. And we know that locally, nationally, globally, people maintain and will accept exploitative work conditions because they have no certain, like the reliance on criminal law as, an, as a, an intervention is fundamentally flawed because you have no job. You might be part of a prosecution, that does not guarantee remuneration or compensation for what you experienced, but it also, there is no clear pathway. So we absolutely need to say this is how we can support you because if all you're doing is coming forward and explaining, but the consequence of that is, well, now you'll have to go home. Um, or all of you will have to go home because this person's not a good employer. We can't, we can't have those systems and models in place. And, and that extends beyond the Pacific Island scheme to thinking about the Modern Slavery Act and the way that companies are accepting responsibility. That is the challenge you put to companies is to say, well, if you have evidence of this in your supply chain, what will you do? Because actually simply, uh, changing suppliers does nothing to address exploitation. Um, it just compounds actually exploitation. So we actually need to think about responsibility and, and engagement and, and allowing workers to articulate what it is they need as opposed to telling them that we will rescue them and then take them home as some kind of, um, some kind of answer to that. So that's absolutely essential. So this, uh, I think, leads very nicely to a question that's been posed towards Farine, but I think also Lara might be interested in, in responding to us as well. Um, the question uh, uh, well, starts with a statement, dispossession is an existential question, and as human beings, we are all being disposed to some extent by others, by institutions, norms, and structures of language. How can individuals resist dispossession without recourse to claims of identity and entitlement that are premised on exclusion. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Lara, do you, would you like to address this question? Uh, it's a hard question. Um, if I look at Aboriginal people in this country, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, when you've got over 200 years of dispossession, um, the attempt to, you know, oh, I won't say genocide, but there, there was definitely efforts to lower our numbers. There was assimilation. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I can't give you the answer. What I can say is I see the trauma of generation, generational trauma being passed down to families. And this has started with, you know, a country that you love and have responsibility in caring for and have a spiritual connection with, and you're depossessed of that um, and not even considered a human in your own country for decades, um, we are seeing the effects of that. And that is we have communities that live in third world conditions in a first world country. And now I would like to uh, say something because, uh, yes, I, of course I don't have answers because there, this, this question is not for a, a specific answer. Now, the problem, uh, I think the problematization of dispossession is important, how we see, uh, uh, I mean, how we would like to see it. Now, from a, I'm, I've been doing research on workers and 
workers and uh, women workers particularly. And currently I've been doing research on Rohingyas, uh, Rohingya, uh, Rohingyas people, I mean the stateless people of Myanmar, who, I mean, they have, there are one million people in Bangladesh currently. And they are regarded as a stateless people and without uh, without any identity rather than having their own uh, having an identity institutionally as minority Muslim community of the state of Rakhine. So now, if those people they want to claim uh, uh, their possession again, whatever they are disposed, how individually, how individually? Because the question is here. The interesting a twist in this question is how individual could claim. So how this individual now can claim that whatever they have disposes, disposes, they dispose the citizenship first, the status of citizen, citizen entitlements as in citizens, movements, uh, and then the right to work because they are living in a cage in, in all those you know, camps where they are not allowed to work and where they're living Living is basically, uh, you know, uh, based on whatever they get uh, uh, from those uh, donor agencies and others who are working on uh, rights. They are not allowed to work. Rather, they have involved with what I mean, what I, mean I really like what Mary mentioned today in our discussions, criminalizations. Rather, they're involved in ped drug peddling, yeah, uh, which is uh, commonly known in Bangladesh as Yaba and others. That is the criminalization of economy and the political economic approach of having people living in camps for 40 years without identity or, with, or uh, without identity or, you know, uh, or giving them an identity, an institutional identity as a Muslim minority community in the state of Latin. Now the question is, of course, the, like you, my question is how an individual Rohingya an individual uh, women worker who lost their job yesterday could claim whatever they have disposed from this system. Certainly it is an interesting question because <clears throat> and if you go back to, I mean if we go back to what Patho Chatterjee discussed in 2004, voices of the governed, say they are the governed voices making democratic, uh, democracy accountable because of, because they have got citizenship entitlements that is they do votes, their one vote counts. And that is this, exactly the similar discussions regarding, uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, equality and inequality of what that Amartya Sen keep talking about, that is exchange-based entitlements and political entitlements. So entitlements matters for an individual to exert their rights. I mean, that's what my research still now tells me. Thank you. Thank you, Farin. There's a question that's come in that is really um, for for all of the audience, for all of us, I think, to, to, to contemplate. Um, the, the questioner starts off by saying, to be slightly provocative, have we ever experienced a time within which sculpt, stu structural violence has not existed? Is it possible? Um, and to dig a little deeper, to what extent uh, could we attribute violence to mass society consumerism? Are we focusing on the symptoms rather than the causes? I'm happy to answer or give a response to that. Um, so I don't think it matters that we've had a history in which there has been violence if we don't aim for a future where there isn't one. So to me, it's, you know, it's kind of neither here nor there because that's, we can learn from that for sure. And we can look at what we don't want, but we, there's no reason to assume we'd have to keep living the way we live and that people um, are discriminated against, experience violence um, and experience the structural inequality that they currently experience. There's no reason for that to be our future if we don't want it to be. Um, and as to its causes, I think that's, there's millennia of causes that um, if we look at a country like Australia, where we've already talked about the fact that um, it was invaded around 200 years ago, it was invaded by um, European people who had a very hierarchical system in which there was already inequality embedded within it, and it had been for centuries. So um, to me, we have capitalism and patriarchy to blame for 
the system we currently work within and there's no reason that that has to be the future in my view but also um you know it's it's patently unacceptable that we that we would assume that some people are um that they're not entitled to to live differently or to have a different experience there's no reason for us to um believe that that's that should be the norm or the standard. So if we go back to the points I made a little earlier about um, like early childhood educators, for example, there's, there's absolutely no reason except for um, misogynistic practices and policies that those women should, who do a crucial job, and we haven't seen that as highly as we've seen it during the COVID-19 pandemic, the crucial job that they do for society, and yet they're paid just above the minimum wage. They're qualified practitioners. They're also um, doing this essential work, and yet they're paid appallingly. And there's no reason for that except blatant discrimination and disregard for those women and their work. Um, a lot of those women are migrant women, a lot of those women are casually employed, um, but it's appalling. And we look at the strategies we've got to get us supposedly out of this hole. Um, and we're looking at things like the home builder strategy for an industry that is male dominated um, and that hasn't actually closed down during the pandemic. So, um, you know, these are just blatant discriminatory practices and policies that have been built up over centuries, um, built up over certain systems, um, attitudes, structural racism, structural misogyny, um, and I don't think there's any need for them to exist. Doesn't mean there's an easy solution, I'm not suggesting that, but I don't believe that they are how we have to live. If, if I can just add to Pierre's great response, I think um, I just echo the recognition that um, that gender absolutely has been part of um, part of all social and political structures for some time. Um, but if we think about the change that has come, there is there is a reason to keep pushing for and identifying that this has happened, because we can see that change is possible and that we can uh, unpack and challenge those kind of structure, the, the structural inequality and the gendered inequality that's that's produced through economic political systems. Um, and I think that's um, perhaps why we're all here because we're committed to change because we believe that change is possible and achievable. And I think when we look, when we think about um, I mean, it's true, of course, that we exist largely um, in in the West, where there are globalised capital markets, where it's reliant on where the state isn't involved in um, supporting and upholding um, the market, which which creates um, different things. If we think about how China, for example, might operate, but if we think about that, yes, it's it's closely connected. The decisions that consumers are making and how businesses are making business, all of uh, decisions, all of those things are necessarily connected and need to be challenge because the desire um, or the need to buy cheap clothing for example we need to think about where that comes from and of course we can't we can't have a system that keeps pushing for everything to be cheap um, and also um, to use material goods in a way that we just throw things away we need to sh all of those things need to shift but it's possible to shift and I think when we when we look internationally it's possible to have different it's have it's it's possible to have different systems of taxation it's possible to have different systems um and structures and to challenge those and to rethink them i think uh it is also possible to see how um businesses and corporations can be part of that change even though a lot of the work that i just perhaps calling to them to account for being um paying lip service to things, but not really delivering. I think if, even if I look at them, the, while there's all these things that they do wrong, if you think about Commonwealth Bank making a commitment and banks making a commitment to recognising how um, financial transactions are utilised within the context of intimate partner and family violence, that is a substantial change. And the commitment to actually doing something about that, I think shows that it is actually possible Though we know that on the one hand they're doing good things, on the other hand, terrible things. So that all these things are happening um, at once. 
So I think um, in the midst of significant challenge and, um, and some international politics that tends to individualize these things and tries to remove the, re the recognition that structures and systems are a part of this, that it is blamed, that it's individualized, that this is you making a bad decision as opposed to recognizing or this is, your, uh, this is a particular group who are criminalized because that's how they behave as opposed to recognizing histories and, and generations of, um, of marginalization um, and poverty and how they all coalesce around policing. So I think it's important for us to keep doing this work because, because uh, I, I think the only reason to keep doing this work is because change is possible if we keep calling it to account. Lorraine, Lara, did you want to respond in any way? Or will I think um, from the perspective that I'm looking at things, it is extremely important to acknowledge the past um, and to do that in a meaningful way as well. You know, if you're going to apologise to a nation, then you need to ensure that, you know, what caused the trauma doesn't rehappen. Um, and, you know, it allows those that have felt that trauma to start to heal. And then we're able to come together a bit more coherently in moving forward. Farin, did you want to make a closing comment? Okay, but uh, I mean, I'm just wondering whether Pia would like to make a comment and I can conclude on behalf of Munash. Uh, Pia? Okay. Um, the thing is, um, we, I mean, we have been, uh, there are, uh, we, well, I mean, when we do research, as, when we see ourselves as an academic as an, uh, uh, and as a scholars, I see these things from two perspectives. One is we do research and then we, got, uh, and we try to, you know, translate our research experience and uh, research findings into policy prescriptions. And we want to uh, see that, and then we start advocating it, but there is a missing link here in, as, a scholar, as, as a scholar I find out here, to change the systems without recourse to identity and all what I've been asked. I think there, is, there must be some linkage in between the researchers and activists to translate what we think is good, what is ethical and how responsibly uh, business society and state or civil society business and state can act uh, into policy propositions. We, here we need, we see that we can, you know, setting aside our identity and other issues here, research and activities need to be more, you know, uh, linked and more jointly they should work. So that is one thing I, uh, to make, I mean, to, to constitute some changes as well as I, uh, I, I, I like, I mean, with uh, Lara, that we have to, we have to recognize, we have to acknowledge, recognize, and uh, and we have to think it from a transformative justice perspective. What happened in the past? Other than that, there is a, another responsibility that we are assigned with as a as an academic that is pedagogical issues, the critical pedagogic pedagogical. Uh, th uh, looking at pedagogy from critical perspectives, how we could translate into our, you know, learning process. So how our students can, I mean, can first de learning and then relearning and get those learnings into a sharing, you know, in a shared space. Because these are just, I mean, our students, I mean, particularly since I teach in business schools, they are the, you know, future business leaders, corporate, uh, corporate executives, or they are going to be the head of the sustainability uh, divisions of any uh, uh, global retailing agencies or for multinational corporations. So in order to make change, I think these are the three things. First, uh, activists and um, researchers, they should work together and then translating all those into a policy, prescription, uh, policy prescriptions, which take care which take long time and then pedagogical implications. Thank you for firing for that um, timely reminder that we're not just scholars and activists, but also educators as well.
Um, uh, so um, I don't want to take up any more time, um, but to say uh, an enormous thank you to the, to the panel, to those in the audience who have um, asked questions. Uh, I hope that, uh, that um, you, you um, had your words uh, responded to and acknowledged in the way that you uh, had hoped. And, um, and to those behind the scenes who've been organizing, um, uh, and I'll hand over to uh, Lara to um, finish us off, I think. Yes, I'll, I'll just uh, echo all of your thanks and also at the same time pull up this slide that we have um, to advertise the CMS webinars next event. Let me just see how I'm going to manage this. Um, so as we mentioned, we've been, um, we've been setting this up in collaboration with the CMS in Touch webinar series and they have their next event on the 29th of June. Um, featuring these speakers. So if you're interested in thinking about how different na nations and states have um, responded to the pandemic, you might want to sign up for that one. Um, and again, a very big thank you for to that team, this CMS team, as well as our own events team for helping us organize this. Um, I think that's probably all that we need to say, except, oh, for one thing, um, I want to... Um, briefly remind you that we do have a recording of this and we will um, provide captions for it. So it will, might take a few days um, until we can actually send it to you, but that will be coming to you so that you can share that with others as well. And I think that's probably all we need to say. So thank you to everyone involved and thank you to all of those of you at home. Thank you. Have a good day.